Hello everyone and welcome to Word of Mouth. For those of you who do not know, uh, Word of Mouth is an adult story time presented by the Juliet Hampton Morgan Memorial Library. My name is Andrew Foster and uh, today I'm going to be reading two books for you, or two stories. The first is going to be August Heat by W.F. Harvey and the second is going to be Land of the Lost by Stuart Onan. Uh, if you enjoy today's stories and would like to join us uh, again next time, uh, we uh, do this program the first and third Thursday of every month at 12.10 p.m. Central Time. Uh, either you can join us on uh, Facebook at the Juliet Hampton Morgan Memorial Library's Facebook page, that's at MCCPL Morgan, or you can join us uh, later that day on YouTube at the Montgomery City County Public Library's YouTube page. I believe that's all the announcements I have for today. So let's begin with our first story. August Heat by W. F. Harvey. I've had what I believe to be the most remarkable day in my life, and while the events are still fresh in my mind, I wish to put them down on paper as clearly as possible. Let me say at the outset that my name is James Clarence Withencroft. I am 40 years old, in perfect health, never having known a day's illness. By profession, I am an artist, not a very successful one, but I earn enough money in my black and white work to satisfy my necessary wants. My only near relative, a sister, died five years ago, so that I am independent. I breakfasted this morning at nine, and after glancing through the morning paper, I lighted my pipe and proceeded to let my mind wander in the hope that I might chance upon some subject for my pencil. The room, though doors and windows were open, was oppressively hot and I had just made up my mind that the coolest and most comfortable place in the neighborhood would be the deep end of the public swimming bath when the idea came. I began to draw. So intent was I on my work that I left my lunch untouched, only stopping work when the clock of St. Jude's struck four. The final result for a hurried sketch was, I felt sure, the best thing I had done. It showed a criminal in the dock immediately after the judge had pronounced sentence. The man was fat, enormously fat. The flesh hung in rolls about his chin. It creased his huge, stumpy neck. He was clean-shaven, perhaps I should say a few days before he must have been clean-shaven, and almost bald. He stood in the dock, his short, clumsy fingers clasping the rail, looking straight in front of him. The expression he conveyed was not so much one of horror as of utter, absolute collapse. There seemed nothing in the man strong enough to, to sustain that mountain of flesh. I wrote the sketch without quite knowing why and placed it in my pocket. Then, with the rare sense of happiness which the knowledge of a good thing well done gives, I left the house. I believe that I set out with the idea of calling upon Trenton, for I remember walking along Lytton Street and turning to the right along Gilchrist Road at the bottom of the hill, where the men were at work on the new tram lines. From there onwards, I have only the vaguest recollection of where I went. The one thing of which I was fully conscious was the awful heat that came up from the dusty asphalt pavement as an almost palpable wave. I longed for the thunder promised by the great banks of copper-colored cloud that hung low over the western sky. I must have walked five or six miles when a small boy roused me from my reverie by asking the time. It was twenty minutes to seven. When he left, I began to take stock of my bearings. I found myself standing before a gate that led into a yard bordered by a strip of thirsty earth, where there were flowers, purple stock, and scarlet geranium. Above the entrance was a board with an inscription, C.H.S. Atkinson, Monumental Mason worker in English and Italian marbles. From the yard itself came a cheery whistle, the noise of hammer blows, and the cold sound of steel meeting stone. A sudden impulse made me enter. A man was sitting with his back towards me, busy at work on a slab of curiously veined marble. He turned round as he heard my steps, and I stopped short. It was the man I had been drawing, whose portrait lay in my pocket. He sat there, huge and elephantine, the sweat pouring from his scalp, which he wiped with a red silk handkerchief. But though the face was the same, the expression was absolutely different. He greeted me smiling as if we were old friends, and shook my hand. 
I apologize for my intrusion. Everything is hot and glary outside, I said. This seems to be an oasis in the wilderness. I don't know about the oasis, he replied, but it certainly is hot, as hot as hell. Uh, take a seat, sir. He pointed to the end of the gravestone on which he was at work, and I sat down. It's a beautiful piece of stone you've got hold of, I said. He shook his head. In a way it is, he answered. The surface here is as fine as anything you could wish for, but there's a big flaw at the back, though I don't expect you'd ever notice it. I could never really make a good job of a bit of marble like that. It would be all right in the summer like this. wouldn't mind the blasted heat, but wait till winter comes. There's, there's nothing quite like frost to find out the weak points in stone. Then what's it for? I asked. The man burst out laughing. <laughs> You'd hardly believe me if I was to tell you it's for an exhibition, but it's the truth. Artists have exhibition. So do grocers and bushers and, well, we have them too. All the latest little things and headstones, you know. He went on to talk, talk of marbles, which sort best withstood wind and rain, and which were the easiest sort to work, then of his garden and a new sort of carnation he had bought. At the end of every other minute, he would drop his tools, wipe his shining head, and curse the heat. I said little, for I felt uneasy. There was something unnatural, uncanny, in meeting this man. I tried at first to persuade myself that I had seen him before, that his face, unknown to me, had found a place in some out-of-the-way corner of my memory, but I knew that I was practicing a little more than a plausible piece of self-deception. Mr. Atkinson finished his work, spat on the ground, and got up with a sigh of relief. There. What do you think of that? he said with an air of evident pride. The inscription which I read for the first time was this. Sacred to the memory of James Clarence Withencroft, born January 18th, 1860. He passed away very suddenly on August 20th. In the midst of life, we are in death. For some time I sat in silence. Then a cold shudder ran down my spine. I asked him where he had seen the name. Oh, I didn't see it anywhere, replied Mr. Atkinson. I wanted some name and I put down the first that came into my head. Why? Why do you want to know? It's a strange coincidence, but it happens to be mine. He gave a long, low whistle. And the dates? Well, I can only answer for one of them, but it's correct. Ha! <laughs> it's a rum go, he said. But he knew less than I did. I told him of my morning's work. I took the sketch from my pocket and showed it to him. As he looked, the expression of his face altered until it became more and more like that of the man I had drawn. And it was only the day before yesterday, he said that I told Maria that there were no such things as ghosts. Neither of us had seen a ghost, but I knew what he meant. You, you probably uh, heard my name, I said. And you must have seen me somewhere and have forgotten it. Were you at uh, Clacton-on-Sea last July? I had never been to Clacton in my life. We were silent for some time. We were both looking at the same thing the two dates on the gravestone, and one of them was right. Uh, come inside and have some supper, said Mr. Eggson. His wife was a cheery little woman with the red, flaky cheeks of the country bread. Her husband introduced me as a friend of his who was an artist. The result was unfortunate, for after the sardines and watercress had been removed, she brought out a Doré Bible, and I had to sit and express my admiration for nearly an hour. I went outside and found Atkinson sitting on the gravestone smoking. We resumed the conversation at the point we had left off. You must excuse my asking, I said, but do you know of anything you've done for which you would be put on trial? He shook his head. I'm not bankrupt. The business is prosperous enough. Three years ago, I gave 
turkeys to some of the guardians at Christmas, but that's all I can think of, and, well, they were small ones, too, he added as an afterthought. He got up, fetched a can from the porch, and began to water the flowers. Twice a day regular in the hot weather, he said. And then the heat sometimes gets the better of the delicate ones. And ferns, <laughs> good lord, they could never stand it. Where do you live? I told him my address. It would take an hour's quick walk to get back. It's like this, he said. We'll look at the matter straight. If you go back home tonight, you take your chance with accidents. A cart may run you over. And there's always banana skins and orange peels to say nothing of fallen ladders. He spoke of the improbable with an intense seriousness that would have been laughable six hours before. I did not laugh. The best thing we can do, he continued, is for you to stay here till 12 o'clock. We'll go upstairs and, and smoke. It'll be cooler inside. To my surprise, I agreed. We are now sitting in a long, low room beneath the eaves. Eckeson has sent his wife to bed. He himself is busy sharpening some tools at a little oil stone, smoking one of my cigars the while. The air seems charged with thunder. I am writing this at a shaky table before the open window. The leg is cracked, and Eckeson, who seems a handy man with his tools, is going to mend it as soon as he has finished putting an edge on his chisel. It's after eleven now. I shall be gone in less than an hour. But the heat is stifling. It's enough to send a man mad. Land of the Lost by Stuart Onan She was a cashier at Bilo in Perry, whose marriage had long since broken up. Soon after that, her two boys moved out of the house, leaving Ollie, her German shepherd, as her sole companion. From the beginning, she followed the case in the paper and on TV, absorbing it like a mystery, discussing it with her co-workers and her customers, so much so that her manager had to ask her to stop. Early on, she visited the website and left messages of support in the guest book from one mother to another, but after James Wade confessed that he'd buried the girl somewhere west of Kingsville, she began to keep a file. At night, when she couldn't sleep, she sat up in bed and went over the transcripts and the mother's map, convincing herself it was possible. She couldn't believe a feeling so strong could be mistaken. She didn't tell anyone what she was doing. She wasn't stupid. The first time was the hardest because she felt foolish. In the privacy of her garage, while Ollie looked on, she stalked the trunk of her car with a shovel, a spade, a dry cell flashlight, and a pair of work gloves. She opened the door, and he leapt into the back seat, capering from window to window, frantic just to be going somewhere. All right, calm down, she said. It's not playtime. Searching on foot took longer than she thought. They came across nothing more sinister than a rotting seagull. But she wasn't disappointed. Bushwhacking through the overgrown no-man's land behind the commercial strip on Route 302 was an adventure, and looking gave her a sense of accomplishment. They could cross this location off and move on to the next one. Later, she added more serious gear, like bolt cutters and a lightweight graphite walking stick, recommended by professionals, whose websites she treated like the Bible. She religiously documented everything taking videos of any ground they disturbed, writing up her field notes as soon as she got home. As fall came on, she rearranged her shifts, working nights so she could take advantage of the daylight. In a couple of weeks, the ground would be frozen, and she'd have to shut down until spring. It was then, when she was feeling rushed, that she discovered a youth store it outside Mentor with a stockade fence and a dirt road running through the pines behind it. Across the raw lumber, kids had sprayed their illegible fluorescent red names. She walked Ollie along the fence until he stopped, sniffling at a weedy mound. She pulled him away twice, and both times he came back to the same spot. Good boy, 
she said, giving him a treat, and looped his leash around a tree. She prodded the mound with her walking stick. The dirt was sandy and loose, and she went back to her car for the shovel. She dug the first hole deep, then shallow ones every three feet. She was out of shape and had to dip her head and wipe her face on her shoulder. It was cool out, and when she stopped for a drink of water, the sweat on her neck made her shiver. By the time she reached the middle of the fence, the sky was starting to get dark. At four of the corners of the self-storage, high floodlights popped on, buzzing and drawing bugs, throwing weird shadows. She checked her cell phone. It was almost five. She needed to go home and get ready for work. Rather than leave that site unguarded overnight, she decided to call the FBI. They told her it was too late in the day. They'd summon someone out to talk to her tomorrow. When she complained to her older son, he asked how long she'd been doing this. The agent they sent asked the same question. He looked over her binders and the picture of the girl on the mantel and the big map tacked up in the kitchen. I'm just trying to help, she said. If it was one of my kids, I'd want everyone to pitch in. I would too, the agent said soothingly, as if it was common sense. The next day, they took her out to the site in an unmarked suburban to watch a backhoe dig a trench along the fence line. Agents in windbreakers and latex gloves sifted the dirt through metal screens, then spread it on tarps for the dogs. A project like this would have taken her weeks, and she was glad she'd called. She imagined the girl's mother hearing the news. She didn't care about getting the credit. It was enough to know the girl was finally home. They found nothing, only dirt and worms. It had all been just a coincidence. As the agent said, there was graffiti on everything these days, meaning she was crazy. Dropping her off, he thanked her. I know your heart was in the right place. <laughs> was it? She could admit that at least part of the reason she was searching for a stranger's daughter was that no one else needed her, just Ollie. She promised her sons to take a break after that. She took down the map and stored the picture in a drawer and watched the last weeks of fall pass. Honoring her pledge was easier in the winter. She used the time to rethink her strategy and to stockpile supplies. Some sites recommended a pitchfork to turn the soil, others a pickaxe. On paper, again and again, she rearranged her trunk as if she was traveling cross country. She enrolled Ollie in an online course for sniffer dogs, practicing with scented rags in the backyard. He didn't always get them right away and stood looking at her as if she might give him a hint. Do you want to pass or not? She asked, or am I just wasting my time? She kept an eye on the website and cruised the chat groups for news. She was afraid one day the page would come up and say she'd been found, but month after month, nothing changed. It had been two and a half years. Besides the family, she might be the only one still looking for her. In March, the ground thawed and she tacked up the map. She'd turned her older boy's room into a command center, emptying his desk and filling the drawers with her notebooks. On a brand new corkboard, she posted her schedule. Four days a week, she'd search, weather permitting. She'd been too impatient in the fall, letting her emotions get the best of her. She'd actually expected to find the girl her first time out, as if she were psychic. She needed to be calm and methodical. If she was going to succeed, it would be because she knew how to work. Ollie just liked riding in the car and going for walks. He had a certificate, but the death scent made him sneeze. The smells that interested him came from other dogs, and he immediately covered them with his own, lifting his leg and making her wait. As spring turned to summer, the only thing he'd discovered was a bee's nest, provoking a swarm and earning him a bump on the nose. He would have stayed and tried to fight them if she hadn't dragged him away. She made the mistake of telling her younger son, who told her older son, who called and said he thought they agreed she was going to stop. I don't see why you're so upset, she said. I'm worried about you. Do you understand why? No. That's why, he said. After that, every time he called, he made a point of asking how the search was going. She refused to lie. The same, she said. 
What does that mean? It meant she was ranging further and further west, devoting whole weeks to a single exit off the interstate, tromping the buggy jungles behind truck stops and fireworks outlets, breaking ground by every stockade fence she came across, graffitied or not. Her knees creaked, her arms ached, and then at work she had to lean over the conveyor and lift a gallon of milk into someone's cart. And she thought, maybe he was right. She was too old to be doing this. There was always the possibility that James Wade had been lying. As her map filled with pens, she tried not to let it bother her. In August, jumping a drainage ditch, she twisted her ankle and missed three weeks, ruining her schedule and giving her son a new excuse to badger her. To catch up, she went out five days a week, but felt like she was rushing, cutting corners. The weather was mild, Indian summer, lingered deep into all October. If it held up and the Weather Channel said that there was a chance, she'd have a shot at finishing. One bright afternoon, she was outside Fairport Harbor, behind a rider truck center when Ollie stopped and lay down in a shallow trough filled with pine duff. He rested his head on his paws and flattened his ears back as if he was being punished. It was not anything she'd taught him. Come on, get up. She whistled and clapped, and still he didn't budge. She had to coax him away with a treat and tie him to a tree, and even then he hunkered down, cowering. The rider place wasn't a self-storage, and the fence, though heavily tagged, was chain-link with green plastic slats, but she went to get the video camera anyway. The trough was tub-shaped around five feet long and sunk a few inches below the ground around it. She brushed away the leaves and pine needles and laid the pitchfork beside it for scale, narrating as she panned along the fence. November 3rd, 2008, 1.27 p.m. When she'd gotten enough coverage, she set down the camera and took up the pitchfork. She dug into the very center of the trough, jabbing the prongs through the crust, pushing it deeper with her foot and pulling it back, so the ground cracked and broke around the tines. She stuck it in again, levering open a hole. Behind her, Ollie whined. Shush, she said. The third time, she dug down and yanked back, and the pitchfork snagged on a swath of fabric. It was discolored with mud and stank of mildew, but was unmistakably a piece of green nylon, a wisp of white batting poking from a hole. She set aside the pitchfork, tossed away her gloves, and tugged at the piece, pulling another couple inches through the dirt. It was the shell of a sleeping bag. She could see the thick seam of the zipper. With a finger, she wiped at the crumbling mud, revealing rusty teeth. Thank God, she thought. What would Brian say now? As long as she'd waited for this moment, she didn't want to see what was inside. The thing to do was stop and call someone. But after last year, she couldn't. She knelt beside the hole digging it free with her bare hands. This time, she would make sure. Then everyone would know she wasn't crazy. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. Uh, it was a little bit shorter than usual, but that is all right. Uh, I have enjoyed the stories today. I hope you did as well. Uh, if you are interested, once again, in joining us uh, next time, our next program is going to be in two weeks. That is going to be on September, let me check real fast, September 3rd, which is the first Thursday of September. Uh, we're going to be doing a mystery for that one. It's going to be a uh, one of my favorites. It's a uh, mystery by uh, Arthur Conan Doyle. It's going to be the case of the red-headed leak. I hope you join us for that, and I hope you enjoy. Have a good day.